Welcome to the Weird Sisters Podcast, your source for Discworld discussion. My name is Manning, and I'm the Fairy Godmother. Joining me is Danny, the Scary Godmother. My pumpkin carriage is a jack-o'-lantern. Sadly, Liz was not able to join us this time, but we will persevere. Our book this month is Witches Abroad, the tale of three witches taking a whirlwind road trip into fairy tales. My first thought had to have been... Ah, uh, so this is what Manning meant by the power of stories in the disc world. You brought it up a few times before in the past, and... Well, now it's obvious. So, let's open up the trivia box, provided by the secret extra sister who lives in a swamp as thick as primordial soup. Published in 1991 and clocking in at just under 73,000 words, Witches Abroad is the 12th Discworld book and the third in the Witches subseries. The title is a pun. Witches are abroad can be used to mean that they are doing nefarious deeds, but here it means that they are simply in a foreign country. The foreign country in question, Genua, is primarily inspired by Louisiana with its references to Gumbo and Mardi Gras, though the idea of building a fantasy kingdom on a swamp may have been inspired by Orlando, Florida. One of the gods referenced, Mr. Safeway, has an interesting story behind his name. One of the classic voodoo gods is named Carrefour, or Carrefour, which is also the name of a France-based retail company, so Pratchett used the supermarket brand Safeway for the Discworld co- counterpart. Similarly, Baron Saturday is a tweaked version of Baron Samedi, with Samedi Nuit More mentioned as a reference to the TV show Saturday Night Live. On the subject of translation, Nanny Og's butchered linguistics are often puns or similar words, such as when she confuses Marty with Meaty to turn Fat Tuesday into Fat Lunchtime. Magrat tries to learn martial arts as well from a booklet allegedly written by Lobsang Dibbler. Lobsang is presumably a reference to Cyril Hoskin, who famously wrote The Third Eye in 1956 under the name Lobsang Rampa, claiming to be a Tibetan monk and starting a trend of scamming people with promises of spiritual fulfillment that continues to this day. Witches Abroad was translated into Dutch in 1995, French in 1998, and German in 1999. The audiobook, published September 27, 2005, is narrated by Nigel Planner and lasts eight and a half hours. This story was number seven on the 1992 Locus Poll for Best Fantasy Novel and 197th on the Big Read Survey. The story begins on the cold Ramtop Mountains, where the witch Desiderata Hollow is about to die. As she looks into her mirror, she sees someone else looking out. And that's not a metaphor. There is literally someone else magically using the mirror to communicate with her. This woman, introduced as Lilith, taunts Desiderata for a bit before the witch hangs up on her. Ah, the original Discworld phone call. We're back to Terry's standby of starting a story with a character dying, but this time we get to see them talk with other characters first, besides death. It's an interesting note that Desiderata isn't directly killed by the villain of the story, despite directly interacting with her. We'll talk about that more in a bit. So, death comes for Desiderata, and she talks about being a fairy godmother, traveling the world and granting wishes. She knows that she can't challenge Lilith, but she's got a plan. Up in the high ram tops, many of the elder witches are having a savat. They discuss Desiderata's passing and how nobody should go near her cottage until at least tomorrow. Naturally, Granny Weatherwax and Nanny Og get there practically as soon as the meeting ends. It becomes clear that they are searching for a magical item, something alluring yet forbidden. In her search, Granny unveils Desiderata's mirror and, shocked by what she sees, smashes it. It turns out that the magic object the other witches had been searching for was in fact delivered to Magrat Garlic, who has been studying martial arts. The object is a wand and with it comes Desiderata's title of Fairy Godmother. She also sent Magrat instructions to 1. Go to the country of Genua. 2. Ensure that a girl named Ella is prevented from marrying the prince. And 3. Do not let Granny Weatherwax and Nanny Og interfere. Naturally, they insist on joining Magrat. Almost as if that was Desiderata's plan all along. To be fair... There's been a lot of wordplay in this book, 
and on this, I did get tripped up by it at first. Desiderata's instructions specifically were to tell them not to come and that they would ruin everything. Yeah. She knows them. She knows they would take one, one listen to that phrase and just say, nope. Which is my favorite part about the witches in general. Just, I suppose, what we would call reverse psychology. Placebo effects, saying one thing meaning another. Direct manipulation is just so prevalent. It works. We get a brief scene of the three witches heading out on their journey. Joining them is Grebo, Nanny Og's massive and bad-tempered cat, who I don't recall we talked about during the Weird Sisters episode. <laughs> I can't recall either, but um, my cat is currently sitting on the end of my bed, <laughs> studiously ignoring me recording. I'm hoping she doesn't get up, otherwise she'll walk all over my laptop and interrupt recording for at least five minutes. Mm, so it goes. Uh, there's a fun exchange during this scene where Granny Weatherwax is horrified that Magrat is wearing trousers. <laughs> Later on in the book, there's a brief mention that Granny refers to those pants as Magrats. Uh, this is a reference to the real-world history of the word bloomers, which are named for women's rights activist Amelia Bloomer. Hey, Magrat is not wrong that pants are extremely good for mobility so long as they're made of the right fabric. But if you have enough fabric in a skirt, it's incredibly mobile. Hmm. Like, there's no, no real hindrance to your legs. Um, I doubt pencil skirts have been invented yet on the disc. I mean, if the purpose is to make sure that people can't see your legs, then I imagine that pencil skirts would, be, would not be the ideal garment for that, like, outcome. True. Throughout this whole opening portion of the book, it, it seems to get dropped off later on, just... It it feels like Magrat is definitely a witch ahead of her time at this point. She's definitely got her heart in the right place, but the way it, it's it's written kind of comes off as too much all at once. Although it does kind of... I just made the connection now that uh, wasn't she the one of the ones later in the book to argue pushing progress even at the expense of others? I don't recall that. That was, um part of the allure of, I think, being a fairy godmother was put making the stories happen, ensuring that they do happen. I remember Magrat said something about progress, but it seemed to kind of fall in line with this aspect of her character. Do, 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 do. Yeah, then you're nothing but a, a daft grandmother, snapped Granny, still fiddling with the lock. You can't go around building a better world for people. Only people can build a better world for people. Otherwise, it's just a cage. Besides, you don't build a better world by chopping heads off or giving decent girls away to frogs. But progress, Magrat began. Don't you talk to me about progress. Progress just means bad things happen faster. Yeah, it seems like Magrat wants to see change the way a lot of young people do. She wants to see change done in her lifetime and uh, potentially be one of the ones to enact it. Versus Granny, who seems kind of jaded and, as she is Granny Weatherwax, stuck in her ways. Which, it, it, it kind of, her character has been somewhat at odds to me as a young person. Like, I want to agree with Magrat's ideology, her hopeful visions for the future, and what she can do to enact it. And Granny's half-wisdom, half-stubborn, jaded attitude. Yeah. I still love them both. It's, uh, it's just uh, interesting to see another facet of their... Another oh, dynamic? Another facet of their dynamic, yes. It's interesting to me. A major part of this book is the three witches traveling from Lanker to Genua. This is comparable in structure to The Hobbit as an episodic adventure toward a specific goal. For the most part, these episodes are broken up with postcards that Nanny Og writes to her family. Postcards are like full of Discworld-style bad spelling. So the first stop on this road trip comes in the high Ramtop Mountains where our heroes take shelter in a dwarf mine. The king is devastated because a recent cave-in has cut off a promising seam of gold-bearing quartz and incidentally trapped several dwarves, including his son. <laughs> but the gold! And there are people, too! Oh, right. People, too. But the gold! <laughs> so Magrat takes out her new wand and turns the cave-in into pumpkins! Which wasn't exactly her intent, but it gets the job done. I think Bubbles would have worked better. I imagine she thinks so, too. 
The witches take a river barge for the next leg of their journey. After a brief encounter with Legally Not Gollum, they reach the mandatory waterfall that comes up in any river part of an adventure, and Magrat's attempt to save them turns the boat into another pumpkin. Sharp rocks at the bottom? Most likely. Bring it on. Then they come to a small dreary town in the shadow of a dark castle. It isn't stated as such in the text, but this scene most likely takes place in Uberwald, the gothic horror country of Discworld. The three witches find an inn, where the food incorporates a lot more garlic than you might expect. Magret gets a room to herself, but it's not particularly restful since the other two are in the next room and bicker late into the night. Hoping to get some fresh air, Magrat opens the shutters of her window. In the process, she smacks a vampire that was trying to creep into her room, knocking him to the ground. He changes into a bat and starts to fly away, but that escape is terminally interrupted by Grebo. Grebo ex machina. <laughs> oh, the perfect comedic timing. They are bad tourists. Like, I would, I would prefer two flower <laughs> over these three. I mean, at least if you're going around with two flower, he can usually obliviously get out of trouble as easily as he gets into trouble. But these three have to make more of an effort. We cut to Genua, where Lilith, the other fairy godmother, is holding court. A local toy maker has committed several hideous transgressions, such as not being fat and jolly, not telling stories to children, and not whistling while he works. For this, she politely suggests to the guards that he be thrown into the prison until he learns to fit her aesthetic. Yikes. That makes a, a major counterpoint to uh, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang's toy maker. All of this is observed by Mrs. Pleasant, the palace cook, who reports it back to the voodoo woman, Ezerly Google. So there's a great bit in this scene where Mrs. Google is using her cooking pot like a scrying lens to foresee the witches coming to Genua. I especially love the exchange where Mrs. Pleasant asks about Lilith's power to see out of any mirror in the world, to which Mrs. Google replies, All anyone gets in a mirror is themselves, but what you get in a good gumbo is everything. That line stuck with me the first time I read this book, and I was a little disappointed when, near the end of this scene, it's revealed that she was lying. It does play into the theme of actual magic being less potent than what the witches call headology. Lilith is using her superior magic ability as a hammer to dent the world into the shape she wants. Mrs. Google may not have the same level of power, but Lilith doesn't understand enough of the world around her to defeat Mrs. Google. All that said, there's some elements of racial dynamics that I'm not qualified to discuss in complete context, but I want to address quickly. The only black characters in this story are the folks of Genua. This means that Lilith, our villain, is a white-coated woman forcing her own values and culture onto a black society. So this is a story about colonization, and while the plot does frame Lilith's actions as evil, I wonder how much Terry Pratchett actually grasps the extent of those connotations. Like, even taking into account the perspective he was writing from, I feel like he would have had more to say on the topic if he had been devoting his attention to it. You could actually compare this story a little bit to Thor Ragnarok in that respect, which leads me to cap off this lecture by saying that Taika Waititi would direct amazing Discworld movies. I have to agree with you on that one. I would love to see just the beautiful, chaotic energy that uh, Mr. Waititi could bring to a Discworld adaptation. That being said, I'd also like to put in that the reader definitely has final say in their own experience of the books. Mm -hmm. Headcanon is very important. So, we get a scene of the witches traveling and discussing the possibilities of commercial air travel before they arrive in the Discworld equivalent of Spain. They have a leisurely lunch, which gets interrupted by the running of the bulls. <laughs> this event, the witches thoroughly undermine with their trademark combination of ignorance and unflappability. <laughs> oh, that was great. Everybody was so confused. It seems to me that the witches are kind of a Three Stooges act, but with the strange noises and, like, a lot of physical humor replaced with just this, like, being tougher than whatever events come at them. I mean, I don't know about you, but Granny Weatherwax, to me, is a rock. Oh, yeah. She's not going anywhere. <laughs> oh, man, I love these characters. I really do. Tired of flying, the witches board a paddle boat, where Nanny Og gets swindled by a group of card sharks. 
Granny Weatherwax steps in, and it looks like she's going to use magic. But after she wins, she reveals that she used nothing but headology and a lot of practice. Although, actually, according to the Elspace Wiki, their interpretation of the scene is that Granny Weatherwax does use magic to cheat. What's your take on it, Danny? I don't know, but I know that one of the one of the card sharks had a card holding device up his sleeve that mysteriously broke when Granny sat down at the table. So I wouldn't be surprised if that had a little bit of magical influence, or that she was also just that good at discovering and reading people's tells at the table. I'm inclined to think that Granny Weatherwax probably could be just fast and strong enough to crush the card manipulating device that he had. Yeah. I think that she does just use like headology and being very good at Cripple Mr. Onion because that's one of the main themes of this book is that magic is no substitute for ingenuity and practical skills is basically the cornerstone of Granny Weatherwax's view on witchcraft. And like magic is just a, a tool in her toolbox. Yeah, you, you, you give somebody some chamomile, chamomile tea, you don't make them a sleeping potion if that's less effective. So, our heroes sneak off the boat to avoid vengeful hustlers, and find themselves in an old castle in the middle of Act 2 of Sleeping Beauty. <laughs> oh, this whole thing was wonderful. So they find and get rid of the spinning wheel at the center of the curse, and the castle residents begin to wake up. However, far from being grateful, they seem to recognize Granny, and the witches are forced to flee. This scene actually really tripped me up, because I was forced to make assumptions based on my knowledge from previous books, because we know that in a somewhat similar put-the-whole-area-to-sleep situation, Granny uh, got assistance to send them all through time, and it felt like similar spell work here. Mm-hmm. However, this is also, to me, where we start really getting into uh, quote-unquote storyland. It was, to me, it's like, oh, this is either time travel or something, but it never occurred to me that it, that it could have been the major twist of the book. Mm. While escaping the castle, the witches wander into a twisty wood, where they come across an innocent girl in a red cloak. And, as you might expect, she's on her way to deliver the third quarter fiscal reports to corporate headquarters. Wait, no, hang on. Oh yeah, there it is. Uh, she's going to her grandmother's house, obviously. <laughs> I'm trying so hard not to laugh right now. Or at least laugh loud enough to uh, pop the mic. <laughs> oh god. The witches are suspicious of this, so Magrat distracts the child while Granny Weatherwax and Nanny Og go check in on the grandmother, who assumes that the witches are fairies who have come to help her with chores. There are so many retellings of fairy tales, and especially, I think, Red Riding Hood and Cinderella, but this one got me because I'm so used to retellings and darker tellings and just all these other stuff that I was not entirely prepared to even hope for a happy ending here. Hold that thought. On cue comes the wolf, but it's neither normal wolf nor werewolf. Granny takes a look into its mind to find a half-mad, partially starved creature stuck somewhere between wolf and human. It's all but stated that this is the work of Lilith, the result of her practicing at making stories happen. With no way of undoing what's happened to the wolf, they enlist the aid of a woodcutter as it begs for an ending. Hey Danny, you remember when you were asking, why can't we just have happy endings? How's that working out for you? I regret it every day. <laughs> no, but it's really hard to say. I know I literally just said that I didn't want to hope for a happy ending, but especially since one of them was saying, no, there's probably not a woodcutter, that's not how this story goes, it only goes this way in very specific instances, and then they found one sort of just in time for there to be Granny's whole, oh great, it's a happy ending, but the wolf, like, oh man, that, that tugged at my heartstrings, it really did. Yeah, and it's interesting because, like, this isn't funny, but it's definitely still satire. 
And there's a key difference that I think sometimes gets lost. Yeah, I would see it as, I don't know, it's a kind of dark comedy where, like, if you didn't get this, like, if you didn't have Granny come in and truly acknowledge that this is a creature in pain, that this is not something that should ever happen naturally, you're left with kind of, ha ha, it's a wolf who thinks it's a human, ha ha ha. You just said that it was a result of practicing making stories happen, which is why it isn't nearly as perfected as we see later on in the book, but oh, it's got that mad science vibe to it. I hadn't thought about it in those terms, but yeah. By this point, the journey has made the witches particularly irritable. Magra is annoyed because she actually tries to figure things out while the other two just make stuff happen. Granny is rattled by their situation and is taking it out on Magrat. The three of them are so annoyed that they don't notice how they've wandered out of traditional fairy tales into a Wizard of Oz reference. At least not until a house lands on Nanny. Thank goodness for hard hats. You know, I didn't get that pun until you said it. <laughs> how dare you? I was too focused on the, uh, the dwarf bread arc coming to fruition. <laughs> that was beautiful. Dwarf cooking is a running gag throughout the whole series. You'll never go hungry if you have dwarf bread, because you'll find anything else to eat rather than the dwarf bread. Even your own shoes. It's true. That's why I exclusively wear boots made of ham. <laughs> why is that funny? After Nanny Og shrugs off of the house, the witches finally arrive in Genua. Magra goes off to find Ella, while Nanny Og befriends Mrs. Pleasant, who brings her to Mrs. Gogol. I'm, I'm glad that Nanny Og and Mrs. Pleasant made friends. They're peas in a pod. I ship it. So, Magra finds Ella, who has been imprisoned in a dank and dusty hovel. Ella tells Magra about how she doesn't want to marry the slimy prince, but there's nobody in the city who can stand up to the fairy godmother. At this point, she doesn't even seem to understand that the fairy godmother is entirely bad. She's like, all she knows is that she doesn't like the situation. It it seems like she's more stuck than anything else, than, than she is kind of the helpless person. Is like, ah, nobody can stand up to the fairy godmother. She's more accepting the situation and she knows what she wants or rather what she doesn't want but doesn't exactly know how to enact anything that would change her situation in the one ungentrified patch of swampland in genua granny and nanny are introduced to mrs google's zombie saturday the three women talk about the state of genua how the old baron was assassinated and the woman behind it all these days, she calls herself Lady Lilith Tompsierre, but of course, Tomps is French for weather, and Sierre means wax, because Lilith is actually Granny's twin sister, Lily Weatherwax. I should have seen it coming. I really should have. This, this whole book, actually, the major twists play off. If you don't figure them out, they really play off as... I should have seen this coming. This was excellent foreshadowing. Just, yes! Derry has been using foreshadowing more and more as the series goes on, and he's also, like, done it better and better. It almost plays off as a mystery novel. I think that I missed it because I got caught up in, in the fairy tales. So I was more focused on, ah, yes, the mirrors, like, in... Beauty and the Beast, or the Evil Queen's Mirror from Snow White. Like, I was so focused on that, I didn't get the literal connotations of the mirror. Yeah. Honestly, I, like, forgot to put that the mirror stuff into it as well, but you're absolutely right. There have been references this entire book to Granny Weatherwax being unnerved by reflections, and the natural assumption is that she knows Lilith uses mirrors as a source of her power. While that's true, and because that's true even, we don't necessarily think through it further than that, that Granny also just doesn't like seeing somebody else who looks like her. I'm going to bring up again how visual interpretation from my own reading experience went. Earlier on in the book, when Granny first looks into a mirror, kind of gets startled and breaks the mirror because she doesn't like what she sees, 
she turns to look in the mirror and you think oh she's seeing her own inflection in reflection that's what your mind sees and then her reaction is oh no she sees something different when at the same time both reactions are correct absolutely and of course like another major theme of this book is the understanding of the self magrat has been trying to find and understand herself, whereas Granny Weatherwax very much knows who she is. As does Nanny Og, but Nanny's way more understated about it, and very much flippant and raunchy and everything. And the many victims of the fairy tales are forced into things they don't want to be, things that they aren't, and that they have no choice in the matter. Absolutely. And the whole part of being a twin is that you're very easily mistaken for somebody else. That understanding of identity forms a major crux of the central conflict. So, Granny and Nenny save Magrat from the serpentine stepsisters that Lilith has posted as Ella's keepers, and together the witches hatch a plan to stop the marriage. The fulcrum of the story that Lilith is weaving is the ball, so they just have to stop Ella from going to it. They destroy her fancy dress, distract the coachman, and turn the coach into a pumpkin then leave to enjoy the fat lunchtime celebration. But almost as soon as they're gone, Lilith arrives to reassert the inertia of the story. Just like the fairy godmother in Cinderella, she turns the drags into a new dress, changes mice into new coachmen, and D transforms a pumpkin into a coach. Our heroes soon realize what has happened, and to stop the carriage, they enlist the help of Nanny's cat Garibo by turning him into a man. (laughs) Oh man, this whole sequence was, it it was, it was glorious. This was one of the scenes, sometimes I'll read off quotes to people who I know will understand the humor, and my mother, who is a writer, I got to read off the scene of the description of Human Grebo. Of course, I informed her that this was actually a cat. She busted up laughing because we've both read the stories. We know what that kind what that kind of description can only mean. It was funny. What can it mean? The description was borderline purple prose with all the adjectives and adverbs and something about black wings on a crimson night and it's just like, "Oh, nope. Okay, this is a dime novel." There was some interesting analysis I read about human grebo that I wasn't able to track down. But it boils down to him being another deconstruction of the animal-turned-human trope that you see in a lot of stories. He's sexy, yeah, which is very much rooted in our cultural associations with cats. But he's still, like, a rude, self-absorbed, and deeply cruel animal. I know at least the person who I was listening to read the book couldn't even read that portion because it upset them so much. Really? Yeah, something about um the the little segment that talks about Grebo wanting to like basically either fight and or rape anything. Mm. And that kind of that kind of set them off and really took them out of the narrative. That's fair. So, with Grebo as muscle, they are able to get Ella out of the carriage and send her to Mrs. Gogol's hut to keep Lily off their trail. Granny Weatherwax functionally hypnotizes Magrat into taking Ella's place. Maybe this is just me, but the scene where Magrad is at the ball all hyped up on magical confidence, it's presented like it's supposed to be, I don't know, funnier than I read it as? It's like there's this intent of a visual gag, which doesn't work in the medium. I almost get the sense that the story is laughing at the idea of Magrad just feeling good about herself. Maybe it's just the result of me identifying with her and projecting my own anxieties that the people I know are just humoring me. It, yeah, I can I can see where that would come from. Um, in my personal experience with the book, I saw it more as Magrat kind of got trapped within herself and there was this shell kind of put around her that was this self-confident, rude, very uh, noble caricature that she was playing out. But at the same time, deep inside, she's like, what is going on? This ain't me. Mm-hmm. So I did kind of see just the over-the-top rudeness of a character like Magrat being basically the opposite of herself. Somewhat amusing. While Magrat is at the ball, Granny and Nanny investigate the rest of the castle. After a horrible visit to the prince's bedroom, they steal dresses from some errant noblewomen to join the party. In the ballroom, Nanny attracts the attention of a dwarf. But no ordinary dwarf. 
This is Casanunda, the second greatest lover on the disc. Uh, show of hands, who else was today years old when they realized that Casanunda is the under to the over in Casanova? Like, I got the reference when I first read it, but the joke didn't click until I was writing the notes for this episode. Yeah, I got the ca Casanova part, but not that bit of it, which you can actually take in a few different ways. I'm just not going to go into it. Soon enough, Lily and the prince arrive at the ball, and the hypnotized Magrath follows the path of the narrative. With Casanunda's help, Nanny sabotages the clock to strike twelve, bringing Magrath to her senses. The witches have sabotaged the story, but Lilith has enough power to put it back on track. She imprisons our heroes, but they are soon rescued. Mrs. Google has channeled godlike power into Saturday, giving him back the same fire he had in life as the Baron of Genua. Yet another twist that you sort of caught on to, but didn't fully understand until it happened. Plus, his entrance was awesome. Though, in her futile attempts to destroy the zombie, Lily drains all of the magic out of the environment, including the spell that kept the prince human-shaped, so he turns back into a frog. Lily flees from the Baron, who then turns to the crowd and gives them an ultimatum. They can either have him back in charge, or his daughter, Ella. Which is sort of presented as a twist, but in Desiderata's note to Magrat back at the very beginning, she did refer to Ella as Ella Saturday. Like, you'd probably be forgiven like for forgetting after the whole like road trip stuff. I feel like I certainly did. Oh, one second. I was just looking up flower meanings for Lily, because that's of an interest. While we're on the subject of Ella's parents, I should probably mention her mother is Mrs. Gogol. I don't really have like, a place I'm going with that, just like for the sake of completeness to anybody who's listening to this without reading the books. So Granny Weatherwax, realizing that Ella would basically end up as Mrs. Gogol's puppet, intercedes on the girl's behalf. The two of them have a brief duel, where Mrs. Gogol uses a voodoo doll on Granny who sticks her hand in a fire to burn the doll. Really sticking her hand directly into the fire was pretty dang clever on the part of Granny. I mean, she was already under the influence of this doll. Magic was already being done, and she just turned it around like, it's very smart. A kind of culmination, you could say, of how they've been saying headology and psychology can be stronger than magic in its entirety. So this is where literary analysis makes things kind of complicated. Uh, bear with me on this. On the surface, this is just a really cool scene. Mrs. Gogol's perspective has been warped from years of being Lily's antagonist. So she's teetering on the edge of falling into the same pit, using magic to rule. Then Granny outwits her to demonstrate that authority through force always contains the key to its own destruction, represented in this instance by magic because this is a fantasy story but definitely analogous to any similar brute force wielding of power that you get in other, in less fantastical settings. However, you can make the argument that this is the book coming down on the side of a white woman telling a black woman what to do, which carries a lot of ugly cultural baggage. The counter-argument to that is it'd be equally reductive if every black character in this story was a perfect paragon of virtue, and that Mrs. Gogol being tempted adds a humanizing shade of grey to an otherwise undeveloped corner of the Discworld. Ultimately, I feel like Terry Pratchett was coming at this story element from a place of respect, but there's a difference between telling a story that includes characters from backgrounds beyond your own and tr trying to tell their story for them, and this book seems to unintentionally stray a little too far into that direction. Those are arguments I have seen put forth rather frequently, so... Like I said earlier, I don't have the proper cultural context to claim a complete point. I would want to hear from people of, like, appropriate backgrounds. So, the three witches go to confront Lily. But she proves far more powerful than them, thanks to her trick of using a pair of mirrors to amplify her magical abilities. Granny offers Lily a chance at peace, to let her come home, but Lily refuses. To protect Nanny Og and Magret from Lily's power, Granny Weatherwax admits defeat and jumps out of the tower. That actually just reminded me, in the beginning of the book when Desiderata is talking to death, I believe, at some point she expresses that a Weatherwax is going to have to learn to lose. And that was so ominous at the start. 
and I totally forgot about it by the time the twist hit, and it was at this point that I remembered, oh man, it just came down like a ton of bricks. It's so cool. Um, especially when, where it went from there. So Lily returns to her chamber and steps back between her two mirrors, but it's not until she looks down at the broken glass on the floor that she realizes one of the reflections is actually Granny, who gives a speech about how infuriated she was when Lily ran off and forced Granny into the role of the good twin. I actually have a little bit to say about that, especially with Granny being the good twin in fr- instead of Lily, because you would expect someone with that name to be the good twin, and especially with her personality, uh, a white Lily, as she tends to wear white, is representation of virtue, of purity, of, in a way, power. Of course, in Japan especially, white is the color associated with death. It, yeah, that, that too, actually. I hadn't made that connection, but from your more widely accepted definitions in Language of Flowers, she is a lily, but she's not the simple kind you would imagine. She's not simple and good. She's, she values purity, but more purity of narrative than anything else. Also, just Lily forcing Granny into the role of the good twin like, harkens back to, to Granny hating things that make people less than complete humans, being subjected to narratives, because that's something that happened to her. Sibling dynamics, being pushed into roles, is something that does happen in the real world. It happened with me and my sister. I'm not really going to get into it too much, but like, where am I going with that? Lily didn't really, I think, understand that she was being the bad twin you can understand that in the way that she frames everything that she does. Yeah, she's she's very self-assured and just, my way is right and I am good because that's my place in the narrative. I am the good fairy godmother, therefore all I do is good. That's the main thing that permeates a lot of Discworld stuff, is that virtue is not the result of proclaiming yourself virtuous. Good people often don't think of themselves as good. They think of themselves as like, unequipped to the task more than anything Mm -hmm. but also just granny weatherbacks talks about how she would have been better at being the (laughs) evil twin that she wanted that role and that freedom and the fun that came with it and she didn't get that because her sister took it and how frustrated she was for decades and it's just a really interesting glimpse into her character the disc world is better off for it, but she's upset. I also like to think of it as an example of relationships are less stereotypes than they are what you make of them. Even in fantasy novels, like, I have been told countless times, oh, it's incredible how good a relationship you have with your brother. Because we decided a long time ago that fighting wasn't gonna work out for us. So... I guess I can tie that in as Granny excelled at being good, even though she was forced to. She made herself fit the role. And while in this story that might not have been a good thing, seeing as how we've already seen things forced into other roles that went horribly wrong, in this instance it's for the better. And I don't think at this point she minds anymore. She knows who she is. So... Granny breaking the mirror causes Lily's reflection magic to reverberate back on itself, pulling both of them into a world of mirrors. Surrounded by reflections, Death explains that they can get out when they find the one of them that's real. Lily runs off to search, but Granny knows exactly who she is, and so is able to escape. Yeah, this scene... I made it through, I saved my pride at the end, I got this scene before it went back and did Granny's role, because at first I thought it was just Lily in the mirror realm, but I was like, okay, what's he saying? Because she ran off, and immediately I just imagined her jumping through reflection after reflection after reflection to no avail, and then I decided to go like, hey, a reflection isn't real. A reflection is reflecting you that is real, and I finally, like, yes, got it, as soon as it got back to Granny. Yeah, I think this is starting up a trend of strange deaths that we'll see going forward throughout a lot of the Discworld books. Death by Riddle? Uh, You'll see. I look forward to it, actually. 
With that, the story comes to its ending. Ella ventures out into Mardi Gras. Magrat throws her fairy godmother wand into the swamp. And the three witches agree to take the scenic route home. Aw, traveling did grow on them. So, that was Witches Abroad. What did you think? I was extremely entertained. Extremely entertained. I finished it, I want to say, in two days, despite battling a little bit of eye strain. Mm. It's probably obvious already, but I like no, I like understanding the novel and catching the twists before they happen. I am the kind of person who will look at spoilers just a little <laughs> bit to see what's going on so I can catch everybody else's reaction. But oddly, this is the second book where Magrat is offered a position of power and throws it away at the end. She's definitely finding herself by process of elimination. <laughs> Do you have any more things that you wanted to touch on? Uh, I think I made all my points during the summary. All right. So, the usual housekeeping stuff. We do have a Discord server where you can chat with us about Discord books, the podcast, and just anything else that you wanted to say, as well as our Twitter, Tumblr. We should probably do a Facebook page at some point. We're going to be launching a Patreon soon with a couple different reward tiers. One main thing being that around this section, at the end of each episode, we're going to be sh giving shoutouts to Patreon supporters. Now, you can check it out for more details. None of us here are particularly financially well off, uh, so that like some amount of financial support from our listeners would really go a long way to making sure the podcast continues to happen. Yeah, and for reward tiers, we could probably take some suggestions in Discord of what it is that the fans want to see, rather than us, us just putting it out there, like, here, you can do this, and that's it. We're not that kind of people. Oh, and of course, big thanks to Willow Carter for our theme music. Danny, thank you so much for joining me. Not a problem. And thank you, the listener. Check your local library for the next book in the series. One of my personal favorites, Small Gods. Ooh. Ooh, just by the title, I think I'm going to like that. Yes. Would you be so kind as to provide the favorite footnote? Thank you, everybody who put in a response. But the winner this time was... Nanny Og knew how to start spelling banana, but didn't know how you stopped. Personally, I find that quite relatable. <laughs> Until next time, the, the turtle, turtle moves. moves.